For the second straight game, the Vancouver Canucks have the answer for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I am Rob Fay, and welcome to the nation inside the Hubcast Media Studios brought to you tonight, of course, by Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plans. And yeah, that score behind me, if you are a Canuck fan, you are loving life because it isn't just a victory. It isn't just the second straight victory. It is the second straight victory over the Toronto Maple Leafs. So we've got a lot to get into tonight. Jeff Patterson will join us in a couple of moments' time. He, of course, of the VanCast and the Athletic and former NHLer Canuck analyst Dave Tomlinson will stop by in segment two. So we've got two of the best in the city getting ready not just to break down the Vancouver Canucks game against Toronto tonight, but we're at the midway point of the season, which means we get to give out some report cards tonight. And uh, despite Vancouver's victory, there will be some C's, some possible D's in there as well. But uh, again, I think on a Saturday night with the 4 p.m. start to see Vancouver answer in that third period. Third period's always been their Achilles heel, hasn't it? Tonight, they answered the bell with not one, not two, but three goals. And from guys that you expect to step up, and they did. So, let's get to some trivia because we want to give some swag away. You know how we do it. Now, a lot of people have said, hey, Rob, your trivia skews towards the older crowd because I'm talking about the 80s and I'm talking about all that stuff. So, you know what? This is a math one. 
Get your calculator, so I'll give you a second to do it. It's brought to you by our good friends at Logo Pro Sports. They will provide the prizing for tonight's winner. And of course, if you've got any customization needs, please call LogoProSports.com. Here's the question. Tonight, there are six numbers retired of Vancouver Canuck greats, the legends. Everybody from Daniel and Henrik right back to the steamer. If you were to add all six of their jersey numbers up together, I told you it's going to be an easy one tonight. What is the grand total of those six numbers put together? You got to remember which six are up there. You got to add up those six numbers. And then, of course, on any of our feeds tonight, whether you're watching on YouTube Live, whether you're watching on Twitch, maybe you're watching Facebook Live, wherever you are catching the Nathan with Rob Fay, please just put the answer there. We will select a winner and announce that before this show ends. Now, of course, we got two guests tonight. Both of them know the Canucks inside out. This one and our next guest brought to you by dogpartners.ca, training solutions for life. And uh, again, Valerie and her whole staff have done tremendous things with dogs of all sizes and uh, all issues as well. So please follow our newest sponsor at dogpartners.ca. Jeff Patterson has been following this Canuck team like a dog this season, and he has probably, like me, looked at it a little bit uh, differently over the last couple of days. We've had a great moment on Thursday. We had Jim Benning on Friday. And now we have a Canuck victory over the same Toronto Maple Leafs on Saturday. So first and foremost, Jeff, welcome back inside the nation. Um, I didn't see this coming, but at the same time, it is great to know that uh, Toronto is finding their stride. And these aren't wins over Ottawa. These are wins against the Toronto Maple Leafs, the North Division leaders. So what were some of your takeaways from tonight's game? Well, I think going to your sponsor there, the big dogs came to play for the Vancouver Canucks tonight. Brock Besser, JT Miller, Bo Horvat. You know what, Rob? This reminded me of a lot of Canuck wins last season where the best players were the best players. The power play was a difference maker. And they got Jacob Markstrom like goaltending from his replacement, of course, Thatcher Demko, stepping into that starter's role, starting to run with it now. And, you know, that's a, I think that's a, a recipe for success for just about any team in the National Hockey League. If their top players come through, the power play is potent, and they get the kind of goaltending that they're looking for, you know, that's a recipe to have some success. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened nearly enough uh, to reach the midway mark with just 11 victories on the season. But, man, 11 is better than the nine they had when the Leafs arrived in town midweek. So good on the Canucks. You know what I liked about the third period particularly? Obviously, the comeback, and that's something the Canucks haven't done a lot of this year but they weren't holding on at the end. They were pushing. They wanted more. And I think that's the sign of top players showing that hunger. And Nils Hoaglander not messing around with that shot. He knew it was in. They had to review it quickly. But no doubt about that, that was the exclamation point. And again, you look at the goals that the Canucks scored on this night. Uh, some quick strike opportunities for them. Off the sticks of the best players. But Brock Besser came to play, as he has most of the 28 games the Canucks have played this season to reach the midway mark. So big night for Besser. Uh, JT Miller, I know we spent a lot of time, certainly when I've been on with you, we've talked about him. But this looked a lot more like last year's JT Miller. And, you know, we can focus on the offense because you can't win without offense. But two games against the Leafs and not a point for Matthews or Marner. The only guy quieter than Matthews and Marner was our old colleague, Andrew Wadden. Didn't hear from him at all on social media tonight. Uh, he was hiding because uh, his Leafs just didn't get the job done, and they took a lead to the third period. But full credit to the Canucks. That's, uh, that's a good victory. That, I think we can put that right up there at the top of a, a pretty short list of their best wins of the season so far. You know, Jeff, there were two moments for me, One of the, and they kind of bookend each other, because at the beginning of the game, Toronto come out guns blazing, and Thatcher Demko set the tone. He made a couple of key saves in the first three minutes of that game. Of course, Brock Besser scores on the power play, and off we go, because we know what happens if Toronto scores or any team scores against Vancouver. They went 0-13. But then you think of the third period and how Toronto came out with a flurry of shots. They were out shooting Vancouver 9-0 to start that third period. But all of a sudden, Vancouver, with, I don't even want to call it puck luck, just some personal perseverance they get the goals they get the victory and Jeff you know it's been such an interesting 48 hours in this city the highs of beating the Maple Leafs twice the concern and confusion of Jim Benning's press conference but when the dust finally settles and we get ready for Monday and the work week that lies ahead you got an opportunity to really start getting on a roll here because these aren't wins over Ottawa these are wins over Toronto so if you're the Vancouver Canucks what do you make of what you've done in the last 48 and how do you build on it yeah, well, I think you have to hope, first of all, that Elias Pettersson comes back. And the fact that they beat the Leafs twice without Elias Pettersson, you know, I think for me, that was what was going to make this that much tougher in the third period. This is a team that hasn't come back in third periods all season long. And without 
arguably their best player. I still think Besser's been their best player start to finish, but we know that Elias Pettersson is their most skilled forward, certainly. And for them, I thought, uh uh-oh, this is uh, not a good sign, obviously, to have to try to mount a comeback against a team like Toronto, a motivated team like the Leafs after they lost the other night. This is the first time Toronto's lost in regulation back-to-back all season long. They had Freddie Anderson, their number one lockdown netminder. It wasn't a third stringer like Michael Hutchinson. And I thought the Canucks were up against it. And so, you know, it's a building block, certainly, but it doesn't happen in isolation. Those best players have to bring it like that every night if they're going to get on any kind of a roll because as we've talked about every time I've been on with you I still think the hole is probably too deep but again uh, there's a lot of hockey to be played Travis Green has said that repeatedly this is the midway mark it would have to be a sensational second half for the Vancouver Canucks but you know I think it shows that they can't feel sorry for themselves when a guy like Pedersen's out of the lineup they've had a healthy first half of the season And I just think that that probably does wonders for the confidence of guys like Besser and Horvat and Miller to be able to lead this hockey club back from a deficit to come back and beat the Toronto Maple Leafs without Elias Pettersson. So they want to get Pettersson back. We're told day to day. The Canucks now aren't saying a whole lot about his situation other than he got dinged up in Winnipeg early in the week, but didn't go the other night, didn't play tonight. And the Vancouver Canucks found a way. And I just wondered, Rob, in that second period, you know, the Leafs had scored twice. And that's been the danger zone for the Canucks is when a team takes a lead on them, you know, they haven't been able to overcome those deficits. And that next goal is so important. And the Leafs weren't able to get the next one. Brandon Sutter had that shorthanded breakaway chance in the second period. And I thought when he missed there, maybe that didn't bode well for the fortunes of the Vancouver Canucks. But let's be honest, they got a massive break. William Nylander had room to skate. And a play he makes 99 times out of 100 off the glass and out of trouble this time it just kind of stuck to his stick and ended up in the seats and out of play penalty and the Canucks were able to make him pay and that got them back on even terms at 2-2 and then moments later they got the 3-2 goal as well so you know sometimes it can be uh, as simple as a penalty and putting the power play to work on the opportunity that it needed the power play hasn't been nearly as dynamic as it was last season but that's where I come back to Just watching this game and the way it unfolded, it reminded me a lot of last year's Vancouver Canucks, and uh, they need more of that this season here as they move into the second half of the schedule. All right, blessing and a curse. If the Canucks get hot over the next couple of weeks and stay in the conversation, dare we say. I know there's games in hands for almost everybody, actually everybody, in the North Division. But, Jeff, what do you do if you're Jim Benning? We'll get back to this game in a second, but you know he's got assets that a lot of this city wants to see him get rid of in exchange for picks, in exchange for anything that gives some semblance of uh, credibility here and getting some picks and something for assets. But... It's going to be really tough if all of a sudden Vancouver claws back into this season and, dare we say, have to make a push because, A, they're right there with the rest of the North Division. So is it, uh, is it the glass half full approach? It's a good problem to have if you're Jim Benning, or is this actually for those who want to see these, uh, you know, the Sutters of the world, the Bens of the world, maybe leave for Tannen, that now he can't get rid of those assets for fear that then he decimates his team at the wrong time? What would you do? Well, as I tried to sift through the rubble of that press conference yesterday and truly figure out what he was saying and what he plans to do, um, you know, he didn't sound like a guy that was intent on making a lot of trades when he talked about the quarantine and how difficult it's going to be under uh, these pandemic circumstances. So, you know, if he wasn't ready to push the panic button and we know that the owner wasn't ready to push the panic button when he tweeted out those six tweets a few Saturdays ago, You know, if they weren't ready to push the panic button when the team was down, they better not get too high based on two wins against the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, let's check in a week from now, two weeks from now, see where they are, see if they've been able to keep this role going. Rob, this is the first time all season that the Canucks have swept one of these two-game series. Yeah, they won three in a row against Ottawa, but in terms of two-game sets against any opponents, and we saw they opened the season with a win in Edmonton, they gave it away the very next night. Earlier in the week in Winnipeg, they were good in that 4 nothing win, gave it away the very next night. So, you know, you can't get on a streak without the first one and then follow it up with the second one. But, you know, the kind of streak that we're talking about the Vancouver and Canucks needing, it probably has to get somewhere close or at least be able to see double digits uh, before we can really take them serious. And that's a lot of work ahead of them. So uh, they should enjoy this weekend. Uh, again, there were performances that you have to like. Thatcher Demko is starting to emerge now. Uh, from his early season slumber. And he is looking, I don't like the term bubble Demko. Uh, He was terrific, obviously, when he was pressed into duty last summer. But I think he has moved beyond that. 
and is just looking like the kind of goaltender that the Canucks hope when they banked on him and allowed Jacob Markstrom to walk out the door and over to Calgary in the offseason. And so, you know, that has quietly emerged as one of the really good news stories is that Thatcher Demko is holding up his end of the bargain almost every time out right now. And again, to do it against the Leafs and Austin Matthews. And and I kind of cut the Leafs a little slack because they were playing the second of back-to-backs on Thursday, but they had yesterday off. They should have been a motivated hockey club. And, you know, they got there too, but they didn't get anything from the top line. Their power play wasn't able to convert. And as you said, early in the hockey game, early in the third period, chips are down. That's where you need some saves. They haven't been getting those saves when Braden Holpe's been in there. But man, Thatcher Demko doing a nice job for the Vancouver Canucks. And, you know, I guess if you're looking for a path to relevance for this hockey club, it probably has to start in goal. And so if Thatcher Demko can continue to deliver the way that he has here, you know, maybe. I don't want to go any further than maybe at this point. But, you know, as far as... Jim Benning deciding based on these two games to alter his course of action over the next month or so, uh, I would hope that that's not the case. I hope that uh, there are enough people in the organization that are realists here and recognize that 11 wins out of 28 games to get you to the midway mark, that's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's better than the nine that they had when they came into this set against Toronto, but still 11, 15, and two, if my math is right, to get to 28 games. Uh, They got a lot of work ahead of them. I love it. (laughs) I love that you stay true all the way through. All right, Jeff, let's get to it. Let's talk a little bit about the midseason report card. And, uh, you know, you've had a chance to dissect this uh, team six ways to tomorrow. I'm going to start where where I should probably finish here. Let's start right with the most valuable player. I know that we've seen Thatcher emerge, but through the first 28 games to the midway point of the season, who is your most valuable player? I think you have to go with Brock Besser, and I think he put an exclamation mark on His night and his season so far gets his 13th goal. He had gone a little quiet. He had gone seven games prior to this one without putting a puck in the net, but sets the tone. I like that breakout for the Canucks in the power play instead of the drop pass. It was speed through the neutral zone. Horvat over to Miller and Brock Besser getting to the back door, taps it in there. So Brock Besser up to 13 goals. Robbie had 16 all of last year before COVID hit. And so, you know, good on him. This guy has shown that he's an elite goal scorer in the NHL and he's got his groove back. And I just think that while Elias Pettersson is coming on before he got hurt here, and he'll be heard from in the second half, and you mentioned Thatcher Demko. I think Thatcher Demko might be able to make a case here. We've seen a goalie be the MVP the last two seasons. But if we're doing this at the midway mark and we're not projecting to the end of the season based on the first 28, I don't think there's much doubt. Brock Besser is the guy. He's been relatively consistent. Uh, We've seen him round out his game. It's not just the goals. The assists have been there, too. And that's a great sign because uh, last year was an off year for him. And so it's good to see Brock Besser back and going. And uh, in my mind, not a whole lot of doubt that based on the first 28, he's your MVP right now. All right, let's talk about the blue line, the much maligned defense for the Vancouver Canucks. If you had to pick one guy that has kind of emerged or given you signs that he's taking the lead, um, I, I think last year there was no doubt who that was, but this year you could probably go a couple of different ways. Who would you go as the top defenseman through the first half of the season? You know, at the halfway mark, I am leaning towards Nate Schmidt. And it's not because he has come in and blown the doors off the Vancouver Canucks in this marketplace. I think he's kind of been understated. And when you talk about, remember, the first 10 games, I mean, the Canucks couldn't keep the puck out of their net. Uh, Quinn Hughes is racking up points and Quinn Hughes at the end of the season may end up being the winner of their top defenseman award. But I think at the midterm, I'm looking at Nate Schmidt, who has been positive when it comes to shot differential, goal differential. Again, this was a team that just got pinned in the first 10 games and with constantly fishing pucks out of their own net. And for Nate Schmidt to be on the positive side of the ledger in terms of goal scored when he's on the ice, you know, I think that says something there. And, uh, You know, again, I I guess if there's an area to pick at in his game, I think we expected maybe a little more offense from him. Uh, And and it's starting to come a little bit here. But he is a defenseman. And if we're just looking at defensemen, Quinn Hughes has been on the ice for way too many goals against. We talk about Alex Edler and all the penalties that he takes. Tyler Myers, uh, again, we saw some of that tonight. Not sure what he was doing on the one goal. Looked like he was tying his skate laces as the Leafs were busy scoring. So, you know, again, you have to keep it. uh, It's all relative here that nobody has been lights out good defensively. But I think there's been sort of an understated element to Nate Schmidt's game. And I would say he's been their best defenseman through the first 28. 
I think I know the answer, and I know our graphics team knows the answer as well, but uh, I can't take my eyes off this guy, and it's been that way since almost the day that he debuted. Who is the most exciting player in your estimation this year? Yeah, I think hands down it's got to be Nils Hoaglander and a uh, nice sense of timing to, you know, put the punctuation mark on this victory tonight with the big shot there. Uh, but from his debut in Edmonton and really before that, first day of training camp, when he didn't look out of place in an NHL training camp lineup, the scrimmages, he started to turn some heads and get some traction and scored in his NHL debut and hasn't looked back. And boy, you wonder uh, what this Canuck lineup would look like if he hadn't been ready to go right from the outset because so many guys in the bottom six uh, just haven't been able to hold up their end of the bargain. But here's this 20-year-old, a raw rookie in the National Hockey League. The goals and the assists are terrific, and he's into double digits now in points for the Vancouver Canucks. But it's the work ethic. It's the puck battles. It's just the relentlessness for an undersized guy who comes out of the battle with the puck more often than not and an absolute fan favorite already. It's too bad fans can't be in the rink to absolutely appreciate him and, and you know, salute him. Uh, and he's doing all this, his first look around the NHL during a pandemic with nobody in the stands. It's got to be bizarre, but he seems to be loving life in the National Hockey League and looks to be, you know, a big part of what the Canucks are trying to build here in these years moving forward. So you just have to love uh, how he gets on that horse and away he goes. And uh, he's been a ton of fun. Uh, I think, you know, if they took the fan vote right now for the end of the season, just based on the first 28 games, I, I, it's his award uh, to lose. No question about it. Yeah. It'd be hard to see yeah. him get knocked off that perch. I, I think he's been that good for the Vancouver Canucks. Okay, last one I got for you, and I, I kind of struggled with this one. I'm, I'm certain I know where you're going to go, but uh, there's a couple of guys when you think of unsung heroes. You know, maybe they're not on the score sheet every night, but they're grinding, they're putting their work in. Uh, I thought maybe it was Adam Gaudet, but we're going to we're going to agree to disagree. Who did you have as your unsung through the first half? Well, let me first just preface it by saying, you know, in a Canadian market with rabid fans and media coverage. Every player is talked about. Like, I, I always struggle with this one as well. Like, you know, whose story isn't told? I guess it d depends how you define unsung hero. But I look at a guy who maybe didn't have expectations on him or a guy who had a down season a year ago and has bounced back. And so I'm going a little off the board here. But I wondered if Jordy Ben had played his way out of the National Hockey League. And remember, he got replaced by Oscar Fantenberg last year and couldn't get back in the lineup. And then Tyler Myers got injured in the playoffs and Ben had to step in there. Uh, didn't start this season because he was in the COVID protocol. Uh, Travis Hamanick was signed and he had to wait patiently. He didn't play the first six games, but has been an every night guy for the Vancouver Canucks since then. At times has partnered with Quinn Hughes. There's versatility. He's played the left side, the right side. He has six points, which, you know, you're not expecting points from a guy like Jordy Ben, but there has been a relative, yeah, it's a small number, but there's been some production from Jordy Ben. But more than anything, he's held his own. He has, he's been all right defensively. And again, I wasn't sure if there was a place in Travis Green's lineup for Jordy Ben. So, you know, that's a player that we don't talk a lot about. There aren't huge expectations, relatively quiet around him, but that's generally the sign that, you know, it's been a decent night for him uh, on defense for the Vancouver Canucks. So let's go. He's got the best beard on the team as well. So let's go with Jordy Ben as the unsung hero. You know what? The only thing I'll tell you, Jay Pat, and I appreciate you doing this today, you just got to take this team one day at a time. You know, who sure knows? Yeah. Yeah, all right, Jeff, I uh, appreciate you doing this, and uh, thank you for being a part of this team. And I loved the stuff that you did with Drancer the other day. Uh, the fact that you had it the same day that Jim Benny went to the podium and faced the music, I thought that was, a, it was fantastic stuff. So keep doing what you're doing, and we will see you uh, during the work week next week. Thank you for doing this. All right, Rob, thanks. No problem. There he is, Jeff Patterson of the VanCast and The Athletic. Um, We've got a second prize that we're going to give out today. A little off the beaten path, but we wanted to introduce this one today. We've seen a lot of really cool and engaging photos of you guys watching this show on your television at home. So if you hit me up on Twitter tonight, at Rob Fay, R-O-B-F as in Frank, A-I, we will pick one of the, uh, the, the funnest pictures. So don't just show your TV, but you in front of the TV or doing something quirky, Show us where you are watching tonight's show. 
we will select one winner and you will also win a prize pack tonight from Logo Pro Sports. So in addition to the math question, we've got a little bit of a scavenger hunt. We're looking for that one picture that you put on my social media feed at Rob Fay, and we will pick a second winner tonight. All right, we'll take our break here. When we come back, we keep the analysis going when it comes to the Vancouver Canucks. Dogpartner.ca has been pretty busy tonight. Their second guest is Dave Tomlinson on the other side of the break. I'm Rob Fay. This is a nation presented as always by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. You won't find two businesses with the same challenges, but you will find 30,000 businesses with the same benefits. Chambers Plan Employee Benefits. It's the number one plan in Canada because it evolves with the way we work and live. Chambers Plan now comes with professional consulting on key financial, legal, and HR issues, and Teladoc telemedicine services included in every health option. This is what Canada's number one employee benefits plan looks like. See everything that Chambers Plan has to offer at chambersplan.ca. to the nation. I am Rob Fay, and of course brought to you by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. Uh, we'll do our out-of-town scoreboard a little bit later. That's the problem when you are the early bird special. Uh, we got a couple of games coming up a little bit later tonight. We'll get you the rest of those situations probably in segment three. But you can connect with the show. Let's not forget you can call a little bit early, get in line. The Zoom room is now open for your phone calls tonight. We'll do our interview with Dave Tomlinson. But don't forget, segment three and even the back half of segment two is all about you. What do you think of the Vancouver Canucks? Are they turning the corner? Do you want to talk about Jim Benning? Do you think the media has been too hard on this team? Uh, I would love to hear from you tonight. And again, it's still early. You've got lots of time to interact with the show. And we will take calls until you stop calling, even if we go beyond the hour that is the usual format of this show. All right, brought to you by dogpartners.ca, our second Canuck insider tonight, joining us from the uh, lush, lavish confines of his, uh, I want to call it the man cave. I'm not sure where it is, but former NHLer Dave Tomlinson, kind enough to join me here tonight. Dave, what's going on, fella? Well, just trying to enjoy a Canuck victory. There have been few and far between this season, but that was a, that was a tidy win in, a, I think, a way that uh, not a lot of the Canuck fans would have thought that Vancouver would have been able to come back and take the full two points. Played, obviously, at every level. I want to talk a little bit about when you get to the midway point of the season. Is it all just one big blur as a player, or do you look at certain marks and say, okay, we've, we've gotten to the 50% mark of the season, we're still mathematically in the conversation? Like, do you guys ever talk about it, or is it just one of those things where we'll be back on Monday? I think every player is uh, different uh, on where their markers are in the season. Uh, you know, some guys take some about 10 games to get into feeling like they've gone through everything from the start of the season to that team game mark to you know get the bumps and bruises out of the way, get the timing, everything like that. And other guys, for some reason, they come straight out of training camp and they feel comfortable and ready to go. Now, this year is completely different than anybody else, and nobody has that experience of what to do during a pandemic to get ready for a season. So they're all in it together. So they'll look at the schedule and, and kind of figure out where you know they think they should hit their mark and feeling their best and uh, where, where along the way you, you feel like you're through those, those dog days. With the condensed schedule, with the amount of games, uh, with very few for practices, I mean, honestly, hockey players would rather just play. They'd rather play game after game, get out there for a little bit of a skate here and there. But I think that this Canuck team, given how they started the season, uh, hearing all the noise about you know where they are in the standings coming into this maybe last uh, 10 days or two weeks, and then seeing that the schedule is not very forgiving. There's only one Ottawa Senators group in this North Division that they feel they can feast on. Now the other teams look forward to playing the Canucks. 
this is a pivotal time for them. And I think the players realize that. And I think tonight's game even showed that, that, uh, you know, this could have been the path of two ways for this hockey team. They could have uh, followed up their nice shutout win with a, a poor effort, or they can show that, hey, you know, they can play against uh, one of the top teams in the league, the best team in the North, and not only stay with them, but find a way through their top players to take a win. Let's talk about the fact that Jim Benning obviously took to the podium yesterday. I'm not going to get into the contents of that conversation. It has been ripped to shreds on social media, but let's talk a little bit about the players' perspective on that. Do they hear that that conference has happened? Do they listen to what come out of their general manager's mouth? Um, take me into the locker room when Jim Benning has his State of the Union. Does that trickle into the locker room or is it church and state? It trickles in for sure. And, and typically there's, you know, a couple of guys on every team that are always having their ear to the ground. Sometimes it's your manager or your, pardon me, your, your leadership group uh, that even talks with management as the season goes on. But there will be usually the veteran players that, uh, you know, are hearing things. And a lot of times it's time spent in the trainer's room because the trainers know everything. If you want all the information, you go to the trainers. That's the guys that are the conduit to everything. They hear from the players, they hear it from the coaching staff, they hear it from management, they can even hear it from ownership when ownership wants to spout off. The trainers know all the secrets. But for this season and for Jim Benning and what he said, and I facetiously said, I can't wait till season 22 23 when the Canucks are competitive uh, on Twitter, you know, the players would understand that their general manager is going to make a statement. And then hear afterwards, through various means, what came of it. So he didn't rip the team. In fact, he gave the team a soft landing and said, hey, there's this reason we didn't do so well. Look at the schedule. Like anytime your general manager is, is you know, looking at the schedule and saying how many games you've played and how short amount of time, you, those are your building excuses for your own club. And so I think the, the players probably felt, oh, that's that didn't go so poorly. I mean, he's kind of saying that we're really oh, doing okay, as a matter of fact. And they're not. This team should be better than they are. Uh, it's been mismanaged, and everybody else has commented on the ways that the Canucks uh, could have helped themselves. Uh, there's some bad contracts that are still lingering, obviously. And uh, you, you can't just shred those as easily as some people think. Uh, this, for me, when you look at the Canucks, you look at... Uh, who has the power, right? You've got Aquilini, obviously, as the owner. He's, he's, there's, the money isn't flowing in as easily as it used to. You go back five, seven years ago, and there's always something new that was happening in the building for the team to, to build them up. Well, that's not happening anymore. I mean, it's a skeleton crew that's running the front office for the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, you've got no president. You've got Jim Benning. So when you talk about power in the organization, Aquilini and then Benning, right? And, and the players... There's not too many players that feel they have the power. Uh, Horvat's got a contract for a couple more seasons and JT Miller. But you've got uh, your top guys like uh, Elias Pettersson, who didn't play tonight, and uh, Quinn Hughes, who they don't know. Are they going to be a seven-year, eight-year contract guy? Are they going to be, be a bridge-year contract guy? So there's some uncertainty there. There's no real power for them. They have to perform this season if they want to get some power. And then you look at Travis Green. I mean, talk about a guy who should be in a leadership position because of the coach, and yet he doesn't know if he's coming back. So, you know, it, there's some a lot of unequal things at play here for this season for the Canucks, and, and it seems like it's they're playing that way, where they're, they're not quite sure what they are, and they're not quite sure where they are in their evolution, and it's the general manager who has his fingerprints all over everything and seemingly is bulletproof at this point. So... Um, you have to have your top players do what they did this evening. Unfortunately, in other nights, they don't have enough depth and they don't have enough um, second wave in offense or even defensively to go on any sort of run. Maybe this is the small start of one, but I, I really don't see it. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting season to dissect because just when you get high, they bring you back down. And just when you're at your bottom, they find a way to string a couple of wins together against the Maple Leafs. So I guess that's the beauty and the curse of being a sports fan, Dave. But I want to get uh, back to... I'm a fan, I think, is what people will say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, trust me. I, I've heard plenty over the last couple of days. But, Dave, let's get back to the matters at hand, which is obviously now we're at the midway point of the season. 
Could you pick a player or maybe with the red pen circle, one guy that if they are going to get back into the conversation has to elevate or maybe take more of a leadership role? I think I've got my guy in JT Miller, but is there one player that if he was able to find that gear and turn you know, it on, could be a difference maker and get this team back into the conversation? Well, I'll, I'll echo uh, JT Miller. Uh, for whatever reason, and we've talked with him a couple of times, you and I, uh, you know, he, he's such an effective player, but he seems... I don't know if the word's distracted this year or just, um, you know, short fuse. Maybe he thought this team was going to be better when the season started. And because they had uh, a poor start, you know, feels the pressure of, of doing more each and every night. And unfortunately, it seems like when JT Miller tries to do more, it's actually detrimental. He seems to get himself into some tricky situations, giving the puck away, taking a bad penalty, that sort of thing. And it, that didn't happen this evening, but uh, in a sense, he... He seems to be what Bo Horvat also was for this team in the sense that he's the heartbeat of the team. I mean, Har Horvat is, you don't really have any issues with Bo Horvat. He's your captain. He's your leader. The effort's there every night. He's an honest player. Uh, he is what you want in a player that you drafted, uh, made the trade, got the pick, uh, put the C on him. You'd want more Bo Horvats if you can. You get JT Miller, you'd like him to also be that same sort of player. But this season, uh, through the first 15 games or so, it just it didn't seem to be the same JT Miller. So I think there is more to him rounding out his game. I know he's getting the points. So that doesn't always tell the story. It's body language. It's demeanor. It's, um, you know, giving a guy a pat when he needs it. It's giving a guy a, a slug when he needs it. And I think JT Miller is coming into that. If he can elevate and stay at a high level and bring whoever he's playing with at the time along and keep the players on their toes on the bench um, and leading by example, you know, no bad penalties, no demonstrative movements after a, a play that doesn't go his way. Uh, you know, I, I think players really want to follow him, but if he leads them down the wrong path, then you're going to end up uh, stubbing your toe often. Yeah, I've, I've felt that you know, there's this old adage that you can feel the energy of another person within six feet. And when things are going well, <laughs> he's the first guy to put his arm around you and say, let's get it done. But when things don't go well, that volatility is something that obviously can permeate throughout a, at least a bench during a game. Dave, I want to get back to your experience. You've been able to play overseas, been able to play here in North America. Um, have you ever met or come across a personality like Walter Gretzky, and not to throw this one out of left field at you, but I mean, this is a father, obviously one of the greatest, if not the greatest hockey players in the world, but is held in equal regard in some hockey circles. I mean, I watched Wayne do the eulogy for his father today, and it was gut-wrenching, but beautiful at the same time. But when you think of, you know, parents and secondary personalities around the arena, you've probably seen a bunch of them. Guys that behind the scenes were, you know, beautiful to be around. Uh, but Walter Gretzky was just a different cut. You've played in Toronto. You've played in Canada. Um, what were your thoughts on that? And have you ever come across a personality like that? Well, I mean, Walter Gretzky epitomizes, I think, what most Canadians should strive to be like. Uh, he's humble. Uh, he, he puts in more hard work than people see. And then when they do see it, he's doing it with a smile on his face and he's, he's very gracious. Um, for myself personally, I would say Gordy Howe. I've had uh, chances to interact with him uh, when he had come to Vancouver. I run into him a couple of times when I was doing color commentary for the Canucks in different buildings. And, and Gordy Howe, ha you knew who he was you knew the legend of Gordie Howe, and yet he always had a moment to stop, shake your hand, and talk a little bit of hockey with you when Mr. Hockey was alive. So that's in terms of somebody I've met and interacted with, because I haven't met Walter Gretzky personally. Uh, I think of Gordie Howe. And then, uh, you know, for Wayne Gretzky, you know, my favorite player is uh, he was for most other players. You know, I've got the Bobby Orr and the Wayne Gretzky, and then I throw in Stan Jonathan for fun. But, uh, you know, Gretzky just seems to handle everything properly. Uh, the fame, the glory, the accolades. Uh, he He's internally driven, uh, but he doesn't, you know, try to make himself better than everybody else and, and, and rub it in their face. He, he wanted to be the best Gretzky because his father pointed him that direction and gave him everything necessary 
uh, the tools and the wisdom to handle the fame and fortune from a young age onward. I, I think they're a wonderful family, obviously, and uh, my condolences, obviously, to the to the Gretzkys. And, and now Wayne himself carries that mantle of uh, everything encompassing hockey, and I think he's doing a wonderful job. He's just such a wonderful ambassador for the game. And then I think his father was just a wonderful ambassador for Canada in general. I probably should have flipped these questions and ended on this one, but I want to bring you back because I believe it was Mark Shifley the other day, and we're going to talk about hockey on a couple of different fronts here, that came out sure. publicly and said, I don't do analytic. I'm not about the analytic at all because, you know what, to be honest, I got the eyes, I can see it, I can feel it, I can smell it, I can taste it, and obviously there's a community within hockey that's like, well, then you're obviously missing the boat, but as a guy that has obviously studied analytic but also played the game, where would you sit on Mark coming forward and being like, hey, man, enough of this number and pie chart stuff. I just want to see it and play it and get it done. Well, I'm very much cut from the same cloth as Mark Shifley. Uh, and there are people that are fantastic with the analytics, and, and that's great. Um, I have enjoyed being around hockey ever since I was a toddler. Um, still play when I get the chance with the Canuck alumni when that's uh, offered. I trust my eyes. And I, I like reading the analytics because I, I find that sometimes it supports what I've seen. I don't think too often I've seen some analytics and said to myself, whoa, I didn't know that. Um, it's more along the lines of, yeah, that kind of backs up what I think. Uh, but I think they're a wonderful tool. Uh, I think they fill in maybe where you're searching for an answer and for some reason it, you just can't put your finger on it when you're watching the videotape and you're uh, watching the games live and maybe if you're on the team and you're a part of the team and then there are some analytics that show, well, you know what, you're, you're actually really shooting the puck from like 30 feet out and you score most of your goals from 20 feet in. you got to get into that space. I mean, that can be helpful for a hockey player, but you do have to dumb it down. I mean, if you said to a player your expected goals per 60 is – you know, it's 10% from where it should be. They just look at you blankly. And, you know, for the players that are playing now, I think it's trickled in a little bit into their psyche of, you know, if I carry this into the zone instead of just dumping it in, you know, I might get a possession stat. And if I throw it on net, you know, I might get, you know, the uh, whatever that's going to amount to versus not. I, I would hope not. I would hope a player plays to his strengths. Um, I think analytics are helpful, but if it if I was given a choice between analytics and watching myself the game, I, I need to see what's going on and, and decipher for myself. I was going to ask you your best trainer story because you mentioned right at the beginning that they know everything, but I think the best stories are probably left unsaid. No. <laughs> uh, you don't ever want to get on the wrong side of a trainer. Let's put it that way, because all of a sudden your skates just don't feel the same. Uh, your sticks are breaking and somehow you don't have any on reserve. Um, yeah, I mean, traders aren't vengeful. They, they can't be because there's too much going on They're They're the conduit between the team and the coaching staff because they serve all equally. Uh, but really, um, young tip for any, you know, wanting to be sports broadcaster, if you get to interact with a hockey team on uh, a semi-regular uh, basis, get to know the trainers, be friendly with them, find out what they like. If they like donuts, bring them a dozen. If they like, uh, you know, frosty beverages, that helps too. But there's been many, many times where there have been, at least my time during being a color commentator for the Canucks and nobody had any answers. Why is he hurt? What happened to him here? Where did he go? I have a conversation and, you know, you kind of hear some things and all of a sudden you have some answers. Love it. Clubbies in baseball, kind of cut from the same cloth. Dave, thank right. you for doing this. I know I took you all over the place tonight, but you're so good at your job. You just make it easy for me. So uh, we'll do this again next week. And, and there's a couple of people wondering why you don't have a frosty bomber beer behind you tonight. Where is it? They're looking at it. They see vitamins. They see supplements. I know, yeah, I thought, uh, you know, maybe I'll just uh, back off a little bit with the bomber. I've got, it's out of uh, camera shop or right over there. I've got my Harley Davidson beer fridge and it's it's calling my name. So I'm going <laughs> to enjoy the bomber it. beverage. And, <laughs> and for anybody else who doesn't know what they taste like, uh, head to Adnack Street there. They're, oh, they're wonderful. Yes, no, that, let's just say people are very astute when they watch the show. They see what's going on behind you. So Dave, thank you for doing this and we'll catch up next week. 
Yeah, it's going to be a, a telling time. Next nine games, Canucks need six wins. Then we can talk about them finding their game. If that doesn't happen, um, boy, then we'll just kind of really dissect what they should be doing with this club. Absolutely. Dave, thank you for this. Peace. There he is, Dave Tomlinson, joining us. And, uh, yeah, you guys are all over it on social media. You're like, dude, where's this beer? That guy has been such a strong proponent of Bomber Brewing, even back to the radio days. It is awesome that you guys caught that. So, Bomber, if you're listening. Anyways, we'll take our break here. When we come back, we're going to get to yourself. We're going to talk. We're going to engage. We're going to interact. We've uh, already put the link out on social media. We've put the phone number out there. Uh, we'll do it on the other side as well. We'll put the big screen up there for you. We'll get to the out-of-town scoreboard. And most importantly, we have the audio and the visual of Travis Green and a couple of the Canuck players as well. So we got a lot to get to still. This is The Nation. I'm Rob Fay, brought to you by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. Back in a moment. great at what you do and that's why so many people depend on you but that doesn't always mean you can handle all of the unexpected problems that come with running a business with chambers plan you don't have to figure everything out yourself the plan now comes with extra benefits for owners like professional consulting on key financial legal and hr issues better benefits staple rates and an expert to guide you through the toughest legal jargon this is what canada's number one employee benefits plan looks like Here in the Hubcast studios, I am Rob Fay, fresh off a Vancouver Canuck victory over the Toronto Maple Leafs. Boy, they beat them on Thursday. They came back and they beat them again tonight. And if you're a Canuck fan, it has been a very good 48 hours. All right. You want to interact with the show. You want to know what's the phone number. We got you. There's no problem about it. And here's how it is. I know in the first couple of shows we were doing things like you got to come in. You got to be on the Zoom call. And that's fine if you want to. But if you also just want to call and we'll just simply bring up the audio, you could do it this way, 778-907-2071. Grab yourself a pen, get yourself a spot on the show. I want to hear from you. We could talk about the Canucks victory today. We could talk about Jim Benning from yesterday, wherever you want to go when it comes to the Vancouver Canucks, feel free. Again, there's the phone number there, and we will actually uh, open up the phones right now. We go to a guy who needs no introduction. The only question is shirt or no shirt. Uh, we go to White Rock, the mean streets of White Rock and Hans. Happy to have you back on the show tonight. Uh, what are your takeaways from the Vancouver Canucks this evening? Uh, we'll get him in a second. All right, we're just going to make sure that we can get... Maybe he needs to put his shirt on for all I know. <laughs> the guys at the back are like... Uh, all right, so really quickly, as we buy a little bit of time, guys at the back, just put them up on the screen. When I see them there, I'll know that we got to start talking. But uh, Vancouver Canucks, here's the deal. They pick up their win tonight. It gives them 22 points. They're in the conversation. No, I mean, they're uh, actually, what do we got? 24 points now. But the games in hand are still the key. And that's going to be a challenge for the Vancouver Canuck fan base who looks at the standings, thinks that they're back in the conversation, and then in reality, there's still work to be done. So we'll have to see if Vancouver, once those games are played by the other teams, are still actually in the conversation all right he is shirtless hans usually we can find him at his desk on an evening like this hans uh i didn't see the last couple of games coming over the toronto maple leafs but uh, i think they look pretty doggone good over the last couple of nights how do you feel i think they look great over the last couple of nights it's that those are the vancouver canucks that we knew and watched over last year in the bubble 
um, talk about Benning, there was nothing much to talk about because he didn't say much of anything. Uh, he just rambled on like he usually does. But uh, I think the Canucks tonight played like a team. Actually, the last couple games, they've played like a team with some determination behind them. You know, Hans, before I let you go, I just can't get it out of my mind, the fact that there are no fans in the stands for this. You've been an usher down at Rogers Arena for, gosh, forever, it seems. And you have this great young player in Mills Hoaglander. Nobody's able to see him live. Uh, you know, I often think to myself, how would this Canuck team would have reacted if they had 18,000 fans cheering for him, maybe get a little motivation? It's kind of heartbreaking, mm -hmm. aside from the canned music, just to, to not see any fans there. I think, and having work, been working there for a number of years now, I guess it's 12 now, not counting this year, it would have been 13, but um, I think the fans would have gone absolutely nuts the same way they did with when Petey uh, scored his first goal there and the way he kept playing. Uh, the crowd itself uh, will get would get right into the into the game, and this is the type of game that, I myself would love to have worked. It's, uh, I don't know, I miss it so much. You have no idea. Yeah, it's been tough. Hans, thanks for this. I appreciate uh, your interaction with me every night. And uh, we've got a few more calls, so I'm going to move on. But Hans, uh, be well. All right, let's uh, bring in our next caller. It is Dave from Ladysmith. And uh, again, you want to talk about anything you want tonight. I'm totally fine with it. So Dave, where do you want to take me this evening? How are you tonight? Oh, hi. Uh, very good. Uh, I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm well. Good. Um, just quickly, because uh, I know you've got a lot of other people there, but my thought is, is this. Uh, if the Canucks make the playoffs, and uh, I think they will, they'll pretty easily win that division. Um, I hear, I was listening to the Toronto postgame show, and it's all about Toronto, and there really isn't a lot of difference between the teams in the National Hockey League. And the Canucks, when you look at it, have a lot more young talent than Toronto does. That's a pretty old team in in uh, Toronto. And uh, Vancouver, I think, took a while to overcome the loss of Markstrom, but it looks like Demko's there now. And I, I would not be shocked at all if away they go, uh, like a young Chicago Blackhawk team, pretty uh, uh, reminiscent of that Blackhawk team, actually, with, with uh, um, Hughes and... Uh, the defenseman for Chicago, I forget his name, he's from Vancouver. Um, they're very similar uh, with Horvat and with uh, Jonathan Taze, with uh, Pedersen and with uh, Kane. would not shock me if they went and easily won the division and moved right along and did something in the playoffs. would not shock me at all. Well, I'll tell you what, Dave, that might be the most optimistic call I have ever taken on this show. But uh, I, you know what? Anything yeah, thanks, is Rob. possible. No problem. Thank you for this. Uh, before we get to Irvin in English Bay, I have to say, <laughs> it has been an unbelievable 48 hours. And I just want to clarify this because a lot of people wanted to watch this show tonight and think I was going to blow up at Jim Benning. I will never call for a person's job. Won't do it. You can go back through all my social media channels. I will never say that said person needs to be fired. But I think it's fair to keep them accountable and want them to do better at their job, which is where I was going last night. Got taken back to the woodshed a couple of times, but at the same time, that's the beauty of sport. And now that we're at the midway point of the season, we can really sink our teeth into what we've seen and what we need to see. And if this Vancouver Canuck key, uh, team can somehow find their way to turn it around and uh, like Dave from Lady Smith says, maybe make it into the postseason. Irvin in English Bay, not far from uh, Denman and Davey. How are you, Irvin? What do you got for me tonight? I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Hello? What did you think of the win tonight? Uh, I thought it was great. Um, as far as the Canucks season is going, I think they've made their bet already. Uh, I had an off-the-ice question for you. Fire away. Uh, so we've been pretty spoiled here in this market with great play-by-play -play commentators. Uh, so I was flabbergasted to learn that there is many in, in Maple Leafs Nation that have a strong dislike for Jim Houston. Had you ever heard anything about that? Oh, yeah. And you know what? The bigger they are, the more you hear about it. And I will tell you this. Jim Houston knows more about doing play-by-play -play hockey than any of the other guys will forget. He's phenomenal. He's also really good at baseball, believe it or not. Yeah, we'll get to the out-of-town score yeah. for in a second. But uh, I, I, you know what? The problem is everybody wants their play-by-play -play guy to be their guy. 
and there's no doubt about it, but when you're doing a national broadcast that goes from the Maritimes to the, you know, the mountains of British Columbia, yeah, sometimes being the guy that's indifferent and doesn't really go for one particular team can grade on a fan, which is why the radio guy can sometimes become the voice. But uh, I have long been a fan of Jim Houston. I, I actually think he's the best guy in the game as it's going right now. I totally agree with you. All All right. Right. Have a well, good night. Thank you, Irvin. I appreciate you doing this. Okay, now we will get to the out-of-town scoreboard. Brought to you by my good friend, Savvy Singh, uh, who's actually posted a post, uh, posted a picture on Twitter. I said one of the prizes tonight was who could post a picture of you watching the show from wherever you are. And some of the submissions that we've gotten tonight are fantastic. I know the guys in the back will go to at Rob Fay and uh, grab themselves a winner. There's one of a baby crying in front of the TV, which... Uh, it's going to be tough to beat. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Savvy Singh, one call does it all. And uh, a guy that I would trust with my homes uh, more than anybody. All right, let's get to it. One game. Again, we were the early bird special tonight. So uh, Calgary and Montreal, uh, pardon me. We got Montreal and the Jets. That's a final. I can't make, I, I, I can't figure out the Habs. One night they look terrible against a team like the Senators and then they just blow the doors off the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Good for them for that. Uh, those graphics still are my favorite part of the show. There's no doubt about it. This one's still in the first period early on. Battle of Alberta. Boy, there's been plenty of battles of Alberta so far. Calgary uh, getting past the Oilers at least so far. one nothing. That one is uh, early on. We'll be off the air by the time that one becomes a final. All right, let's go back to the phones. Man, this is what I told you, man. Once we get that phone number working, we're going to be a business. We go to the nation's capital. It is Matt from Ottawa. Matt, how are you tonight? Oh, I'm good. How are you? So far, so good. What do you got for me? Well, I just wanted to say that, obviously, uh, the Canucks and what Benning have been doing has been really frustrating with these inefficient contracts in the bottom six. But silver lining, Jace Hauerluck and Michael from Germany, these guys were solid they weren't a liability. They moved the puck out. They weren't super dangerous, but I just love to see that, and I'd like to see more guys like that filling out the bottom six. You know what? And if uh, the Canucks fall out of favor, they might get their chance sooner rather than later. But uh, thank you for the phone call, by the way. The problem that you face is you got guys that are making millions of dollars. And outside of Louis Erickson and occasionally Jake Vertanen at certain points over the last year or two, you don't want all that money sitting up in the press box. So if they're healthy, these guys are going to play. Uh, but you're right. Uh, Michaelis was a guy that impressed a lot of the media, even at training camp, that abbreviated pocket that they got to work out some of the kinks. And um, it's hard to get a beat on what the future looks like right now for the Vancouver Canucks because there's not a lot of spaces where you can just insert a guy. Like, you think of Adam Gaudet fighting for time, and you think of all these guys, and now Nils Hoaglander is looking like he's solidified one of his spots on this team. Uh, there's just not a lot of opportunity for these guys that are quote-unquote bubble players and taxi squad guys. So uh, outside of a Pedersen injury that opens up potentially a spot for somebody, um, you got to take them for what they are. But down the road, once some of these contracts exit stage left, maybe opportunity knocks for them a little more frequently. Okay, let's get to the uh, post-game conferences because I want to squeeze this one in before we wrap up the show. Travis Green was at the podium, and uh, I'm not sure how elated he was, but again, two wins in a row. First time they've done that since January. Here is the head coach of the Canucks just moments ago. And we'll take our first one here from Brendan Batchelor. Hey, Travis, uh, let's start with the third period. How pleased were you with your group's ability to battle back and find a way to win this game? Yeah, very pleased. Um, overall, pleased with the game. Obviously, there's a lot of ebbs and flows in a game, especially when you play a team like Toronto. Um, didn't like the start of our third. I thought we were on our heels a little bit, and, uh, and then we got going. How important was Thatcher in that stretch to hold you guys in the game when they were heavily out shooting you? Yeah, I, I think they got, uh, I don't know what it was at the end, I think nine shots in the first seven minutes or something, or eight minutes. And, uh, you know, he stood tall there. Okay, next up is Ian McIntyre. Travis, we've asked you a lot about JT Miller this year. What would you say about uh, him tonight and the way he played? Yeah, he was, he was, very good. Um, you know, we've asked him to step in and play center. Uh, 
he's had a taste of playing center when he plays with PD because he, he does take a lot of face-offs and ends up playing down low. Just felt like that was a natural um, fit uh, as a replacement. And, um, you know, it's a tall task when you're going up against, you know, some of their lines that they have. He's played head-to-head -head against Tavares' line pretty well for both games. And uh, he was good tonight. And, uh, most of the players don't know the stats that you guys hadn't won a game from behind. Uh, but when you win a game this way against that team, might it help you down the road? I think it'll give us confidence. Um, you know, I, I do think our team is, has been feeling good about their game. Uh, they haven't been getting the results. And that's, that's been a, probably a mental fight with themselves. Uh, even as as us with coaches, how we how we talk to them, when to push them, when to turn the heat up, knowing that their confidence, uh, no matter what, even when you know you're playing well and and you haven't won. So there's the head coach Travis you know, Green of the uh, Vancouver you, um, Canucks. I'm sorry, we're slipping from one to the other just because I want to make sure that we can fit this into the show. Uh, the captain Bo Horvat also took to the podium with a guy that Jeff Patterson called the first half of the season MVP. Here is Bo and Brock post game. Hi guys, uh, let's start with you, Brock. Just uh, you know, how emotional of a win is that for this group to come from behind and beat a team like that tonight? Yeah, um, it's huge. Um, Murph just gave me the stat that we were 0 13 when trailing after two periods. So I mean, uh, you can only assume that you know it's it's been a tough go, and for our our team to keep battling and stick to the process tonight is, uh, I think it's huge for a group and gives us a lot of confidence. And Bo, how about uh, Thatcher's performance tonight, particularly early in that third period when Toronto was pressing, trying to extend their lead? Yeah, he was phenomenal again tonight. I mean, he's been great as of late for us. Um, I just told him that in the room and, and, you know, you need great goaltending in order to win this league. And he stepped up in a, in a big way and we're just, I'm happy we, we scored enough goals to, to help him out because he definitely helped us out. Okay, we'll go next to Ian McIntyre. Hey, Bo, uh, first of all, were you aware of the stat that you guys hadn't won while trailing in the third? And does this um, kind of break through a mental hurdle uh, for the team to, to do it this way against the Leafs? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know uh, the stat. I mean, I try not to you know, look at that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, and I, for us to do it against a team like that definitely gives our group confidence. But again, you know, we got to turn the page. Um, there's a lot of hockey left to be played, and you know we got to keep winning hockey games to get back in it. So um, it was a, again another good step for us. But um, you know, enjoy it, and um, you know, move on to the next one. Brock, how confident are you, uh, given the way the team has played the last while? And now it seems finally getting a couple of results. How confident are you that the second half of the season is going to be better for you than the first half has been? I'm pretty confident. Um, you know, obviously, it, some new guys, and it, it took a little bit to match together there. But, um, you know, I think we've been talking about how well we've been playing lately. Um, I mean, even look back to the past 10 games, not getting some of the results that we wanted. But, um, you know, we're playing really well defensively, and I think that kind of sets up our whole game. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, I think the second half is going to be a lot better, and um, you know we need to continue to find ways to get wins right now. Next All right, there he is, Bo Horvat, and you just heard from Brock Besser. Besser's 13th of the season tonight. Again, as Jeff Patterson mentioned, three away from his total from all of last season, and he's still got a half season to reach that number. Knock on wood. Bo Horvat tonight with his 11th, JT Miller with his 7th, and Nils Hoaglander with his 5th. So a good night all around for the Vancouver Canucks who beat Toronto, the division leaders, for a second straight time. I would like to think that that will take a little pressure off this team heading into the work week, but there is work to be done. All right, let's get to our trivia question. This, of course, brought to you by our good friends at Logo Pro Sports. At the beginning of the show, I said there are six retired numbers for the Vancouver Canucks. And you guys were saying I'm only asking stuff that guys in their 50s and 60s would know. This is easy. It's a math question. If you were to take all six of those banners and add up those six jersey numbers, what is the total? Uh, the answer? Let's put it up, boys. I didn't bring my calculator. <laughs> what do we got? 10, carry the one. It is 112. 
Room 112, where the players dwell. Uh, by the way, it also happens to be the Canucks record for most points in the season, 112. That was Henrik Sedin back in a, a great campaign, 2009-2010. Our winner, there they are, the six numbers. That was a pretty easy question. I'm not going to lie. That's the one star out of the five. That's the easiest one you might get this year. Is Cowboy Kurt, Curtis Gulliford. You've won a prize pack courtesy of our good friends uh, at, from another Kurt. LogoProSports.com, where you can get all your custom apparel and sportswear. <laughs> I'm so impressed that he won. There's the logo in the back. And again, support these guys. If you're doing anything for your business, your beer league, whatever it takes, make sure that you pass this on to Kurt and my friends over at Logo Pro Sports. Okay, Vancouver Canucks looked good tonight, didn't they? By the way, the second pitcher, the second prize that we have, I went to social media. I don't know if we're going to have this picture that we could put up on the screen fast enough. I put this one in Jordan's lap just seconds ago. Guys in the back, uh, I apologize for it, but uh, I will retweet it, the winning one. It is of the little child crying right in front of the TV, which is uh, a reaction that uh, I get. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever gotten it on TV, but nonetheless, thank you for posting where you watch this show. And do not forget that you can subscribe if you're watching tonight on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like buttons if you're on Facebook Live. And don't forget, we have the audio version of this show. And trust me, you can listen to it tomorrow when you're driving around doing your errands on a Sunday morning. Lots of feedback with Jeff Patterson. Lots of feedback with Dave Tomlinson. We we had some callers everywhere from Ottawa up to Ladysmith, English Bay, Shirtless Hans and White Rock. Uh, it's so great to have you guys engaging with this show, and we will do it just a couple of days from now. Hey, big win for Vancouver. The highs and lows of the last 48 hours were something to be seen, but uh, we'll be back on the air a couple of days from now. My thanks to everybody with Hubcast Media, and most importantly, my thanks to you for logging on tonight and making me a part of your early evening. Go and enjoy the rest of your night. Your hometown guys did it and did it well over the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight. My thanks to the Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan for supporting us and making sure that we can bring you this broadcast and to all of my sponsors who have been so great. Small business is alive and well in this community and they are propping me up as we bring this coverage to you tonight. Until I see you two nights from now, I'm Rob Fay, and this has been The Nation. Good night, everybody.